A man can be destroyed but not defeated. Powerful words, aren't they? But to understand the relevance of these words, we need to understand the old man San Diego and the greatest fish he ever caught in his life. When the story starts, we are taken to Cuba and its capital city, Havana. Imagine the Gulf Stream. Imagine skiffs lying around, shacks of houses here and there. There is a hotel a bit far away from here, which is called as the Terrace. This is a fishing community, basically. And you have a shark factory where sharks are being processed. We have one particular fish that is the focal point here. And that would be what you know, know as the huge marlins. The fishing community here depend upon marlin catch for their sustenance. When we see San Diego, the old man in the story, our title protagonist of the story, he has passed 84 days without catching a fish. 84 long days. For 40 of those days, a young boy who deeply loved San Diego like his own father, his name is Manolin, was there with San Diego in the ship. But as days passed by and San Diego began to feel himself unlucky because he could not catch this huge marlins, not even a single marlin in the last 40 days. Other people, including Manolin's parents, started calling San Diego as a Salao. And Salavo would mean the worst form of unlucky. People started giggling behind San Diego. People started mocking him, making fun of him. And so Manolin, even though he did not want to leave San Diego, because of the pressure of his parents, had to leave San Diego and join another fishing boat. But his parents did not regret that decision because the very first week where Manolin joined another fishing boat, they were able to catch Manolin's but not San Diego. San Diego spent yet many, many more days. And when we meet him in page one of our beautiful story, Old Man and the Sea, we find a tired looking San Diego coming back the 84th night. He comes back home. But you do understand that there is no sense of defeat in his voice. Now, who is San Diego? We have seen San Diego as an old man, a tired man. We find him having deep wrinkles on his face. We find him having patches of brown skin. The text calls it benevolent skin cancer by being exposed to the sun on his body. Scars all over his body, as old as erosions in a fishless desert, is what the text calls him. Everything around him is old, except for his eyes. His eyes were the color of the sea, and they were cheerful and undefeated. This cheer, this undefeatedness that reflects through his eyes, is what we see in this old man who even after 84 days of going out into the sea coming back without having a single catch of a marlin when all the others around him bring in their loot he stands there empty-handed and when the story starts Manolin watches from the beach how San Diego comes in Pulling up the huge mast, mast would be a wooden T sort of a thing. He pulls up this wooden mast, hauls it on, alone, lonely, and Manolin feels sorry for this poor man. 
his father whom he would have called if he could. The old man San Diego had taught Manolin fishing when he was just five years old. We see beautiful examples of love between them, sharing stories with each other. Manolin says, I remember very clearly whatever you have told me over all these years. And the fatherly affection from San Diego towards Manolin is so clear in those lines. San Diego misses Manolin badly when he is at sea. As we progress, we do understand the number of times San Diego says, I wish I had the boy. I wish the boy were with me. These words do keep coming up and down. And every day when San Diego returns back from the sea, Manolin eagerly waits at the beach, hoping against hope that at least today he will have a Marlin and everything would be okay. Likewise, when we meet him on day 84, that day too, he is there at the beach, waiting for San Diego to come in with his things. When we find San Diego, we also find that San Diego has a mast, the wooden tea that he is trying to bring in. He has a wooden box with lines that he uses for fishing. He has something called as a gaff and gaff would be a stick with a hook to catch the fish. We also have something that you call as a harpoon. Harpoon would be a spear attached to the long rope. These are the things that no fisherman would leave on their skiff. Skiff would be the small boat that these people use for fishing. The skiffs used on the Gulf Stream. Boats fit enough for one person or two people, fit enough for survival on the rough seas for a day. Every day, rather every night by the time the day is done and the haul is done, they make sure, and so does San Diego, to carry all of these things back to their little shack because they do not want to leave it out in the open. So for safety's sake, the mast the wooden box carrying the lines, the gaff, the harpoon are all dragged in. Remember, San Diego is a very old man. He drags all of these in to the tiny shack where he lives. And Manolin lives close by. This is what we find in the initial pages of our story. And while we are taken to San Diego's shack, if this is San Diego's shack and this is Manolin's shack, while we are taken to San Diego's shack, we do understand that his house or rather the shack has bare necessities. It has a bed, it has a table, a single chair, a cooking place, two photographs, one of the sacred heart of Jesus and the other one of the Virgin of Scorpion. He had a picture, framed picture of his wife, but she died long back. And so because he felt lonely watching that picture there on the wall, he had taken it away. These are the bare necessities that marked San Diego's existence. But the message that we get through this plot is always a story of optimism. You find San Diego when he speaks to Manolin saying, 85 is a lucky number and tomorrow I'm pretty sure I'm going to catch a fish. Every day this would have happened. Like the little game Manolin and San Diego play every night. A heart-rending little game. There is nothing in San Diego's house to eat. Nevertheless, this is a conversation they have every night before San Diego goes to sleep. A game that they play. 
But the boy asks San Diego, what is for dinner? And San Diego says, a pot of yellow rice and fish. He would offer it to the boy and the boy would say no. This happens even when both of them know that there is no food in the house. Manolin, knowing this, tries his level best to make sure San Diego is comfortable. He goes and tells San Diego, tell me your story. He tells San Diego, let me go and get bait for you. Bait is what you use in the hook to catch the marlin. Let me go and get bait for you. Let me go and get food for you. We do understand the amount of affection Manolin has to the boy and the affection San Diego gives back because he does say that I am doing this because I need Manolin to understand that he should not be defeated. This power of optimism seeps to us through the text. As the plot progresses, after this little game of yellow rice and fish, Manolin goes to the terrace to get the bait fish and to see if they could get something for dinner. And he returns carrying a steel tiffin, something that Mr. Martin gave to San Diego and San Diego is touched by the kindness of the hotel owner. Among the stories that they share, there is a pertinent story of baseball that comes through San Diego's words. Both of them are baseball fans and particularly one person whose name is DiMaggio keeps propping up and up. DiMaggio is San Diego's star, hero and San Diego looks up at DiMaggio and imagines many a time how it would be to take DiMaggio fishing one day. Another factor that binds San Diego to this very famous national baseball player is the fact that his father, DiMaggio's father, was also once a fisherman. And San Diego believes that maybe he will understand life as to how San Diego would imagine it to be. At moments of self-defeat, at moments of trouble, San Diego continuously flips back his thoughts at DiMaggio and derives inspiration from DiMaggio's efforts at the football play. While the two speak of baseball, Manolin looks at San Diego and says, there might be great fishermen, but the best fisherman is you. San Diego looks at him and says, a single sentence that will later on tell us the struggle that he did was to prove himself right here. He looks at Manolin, who eager facedly looks at San Diego and says, you're the best fisherman in the world. And San Diego says, I hope no fish will come along so great that it will prove us wrong. And so for Manolin, no matter what the obstacle might be that would come his way, San Diego gears himself up to face the challenges of the Gulf Stream. San Diego dreams the previous night of lions playing on an African beach. Long yellow golden beaches and lions playing. This is a dream he will dream continuously. And we find the same dream recurring thrice within the text. The text opens and closes with the same dream of lions playing on long golden beaches. On the 85th day morning, San Diego wakes up Manolin, as is his routine. Manlin hates to be called up by his father, 
would always prefer San Diego's waking him up. And as you would remember, the shacks are nearby. San Diego would slowly open the door, let the morning light fall on Manolin, and he would wake up seeing San Diego. Manolin gives San Diego the bait that they had kept on the ice, and San Diego rolls the skiff down into the clean morning ocean. When we see San Diego on the boat, there are four bait lines that go down the skiff. One bait line would be at 40 feet, the second at 75 feet, the third and the fourth at 100 and 125 feet down. He also has a spare reserve coil that amounts to 375 fathoms down. While Santiago is at sea, there are many creatures of the ocean that Hemingway brings to our attention. Flying fish, whom San Diego calls as his principal friends of the ocean is one. There are seabirds that we meet along the way. Three seabirds, the warbler, the hawkbill and the man of war birds. There are seaweeds that we find, phosphorus fluorescent seaweed, the gulf weed and the sargasso weed are part of the seaweeds. There are dolphins, schools of dolphins who jump by, who San Diego calls as beautiful creatures and even at times refers to as brothers. There is a Portuguese man of war, a small animal, blue in color, almost like a jellyfish. There are schools of jellyfish that we find, who Santiago in Portuguese call as the Aguamala. And he also calls the jellyfish as a whore. You find turtles, the great trunk back turtles at sea. We find albacore, a particular sort of a tuna fish that is brought into reference much in the work. We also find porpoises, animals that look like or rather fish that look like dolphins but is in fact but in fact belongs to the family of whales. A quick glimpse, these are the multiple variants of animal life that is brought into the text by Hemingway. As the old man moves through the Gulf Stream, baits in its place, one by one, he finds nature waking up that bright day morning and he talks to them as if he would talk to Manolin. This is family. And so he later on says something that immediately brings us back to the idea how closely knit people were, particularly San Diego was to the environment that he was living in with the geese flying by, with the rabbler sitting on his boat, with dolphins and flying fish moving on around it, with porpoises mating around him, with Portuguese man at war and jellyfish around. How can anybody be lonely? And how can anyone be alone when he is at sea? The journey that we have seen of Santiago is about to start. Days on he is going to be in the sea. Anyone else would have been dejected. By 84 days, 
of not having a good catch, but not San Diego. His joy, his optimism, his positive energy is what keeps him going. His hands are tired, his body is tired, but every day morning, when he opens his eyes into the clean air of the ocean, he feels himself at home. 85th day, and it's almost noon time. As San Diego moves further and further into the ocean, he understands while looking back that the shoreline of the Havana is not visible to him. Suddenly, he finds a dip and one of the smaller bait lines catches a 10-pound tuna. San Diego is relieved. At least this tuna can be used as a bait. When you look into the bait lines that are here, the shorter bait lines usually carry sardines. What they do is they hook into the eyes of the sardine and put it down. And the longer bait lines usually carry tuna or albacore. So when he gets this 10 pound tuna, he's relieved. This journey and at least today, he was able to get something that might attract a larger marlin. Time clicks away and it's almost noon time. And suddenly, he finds one of the longer lines dipping. The green stick, almost as thick as a pencil that is attached here to the larger lines dip. He becomes quite excited. Eat it, fish, eat it. He almost pleads. Don't be shy, fish, eat it. There is a gentle pulling. By now he understands that in all possibility this tuna here could have been swallowed by the marlin. But the marlin has to swallow it so that the bait line will go inside the mouth of the fish and then it would be easier for it to be caught. So San Diego remains as quiet as he can without moving so that the fish would be comfortable in eating this bait and falling into the trap. He remains quiet and then he understands that this fish is large by the amount of pull that it is acting on to this bait line, he understands that this is a fish of tremendous power, large in its size, unbelievably heavy. The pull that the skiff faces is hard and strong, stronger than he has ever seen. San Diego slowly keeps giving on reserve coil, making the fish more comfortable. He uses the reserve coil, loosens it up so that the fish would be comfortable eating the bait. And fish would be comfortable in being pulled up slowly. San Diego quickly says a thank you note saying, thank God the fish is not going down because if it went down, then the skiff itself might be in a danger of being sunk. But instead of moving down, the fish thankfully moved towards the east. Quickly, pulling this little skiff with San Diego inside, pulling it along to the east quickly, swiftly and four hours later the fish was still swimming out into the sea. When San Diego looks back the Havana is long past gone even the glow of the Havana is lost. Night would come quickly and by the time it became night the fish was still pulling him deeper and deeper into the sea. And it was one full day at the sea. Cold wind was blowing by. 
Santiago had a sack covering the bait box without moving a hand because he did not want the line to move much and the fish to frantic, fish to panic. Without moving that hand, he managed to hold the sack, keep it over his body, ties it around his neck and tries to position himself to a point where he would be comfortable. And as always, he kept wishing. I wish the boy had been here. As he sat there at night, he tried to remember the saddest thing that he has ever seen in the ocean. Two marlins, a couple. The male marlin usually steps back and allows the female to feed. The female marlin ate the bait and in its panic started circling around frantically. Santiago and the boy saw the male marlin circling around his wounded partner. The female did not know what to do and the female was stuck with the pain. Finally, the old man clubbed the female and pulled her onto the boat. The male fish jumped high into the air to see where the female fish was. It spread its wings and went deep down into the water. After spending an entire day with her in her agony, as a final bid of goodbye, he spreads his wings down, peers into the boat, sees his dead partner and the final wave of goodbye slips down into the sea, never to be found again. To San Diego, this was one of the saddest thing he, has, he had found in the ocean. Day 86 and the marlin was still swimming out into the large ocean. When the sun rose on the 86th day, San Diego thought that the fish was not tired. He started pitying the fish because it was the choice of the fish to remain deep down, stay away, deep down, away from snares. And it was San Diego's choice to go into deeper waters further than where the normal fishermen usually ventured to find him. Fate had joined them together since yesterday and the journey was together since yesterday. He calls the fish wonderful. He calls the fish strange and says fish I love you and respect you, but I will kill you before the day ends. While he is speaking to vent away his emotions, to vent away his tiredness, he speaks to the wobbler who comes and sits on the boat. He speaks to his hands that are slowly becoming cramped. Remember, he is holding the bait line in his hand and is almost cutting his skin. By the pressure the fish is applying on the line, his skin, which is already scarred, is cut deeply seared. To save himself from hunger, San Diego takes the tuna, cuts it into thin strips, dries it for a while and eats it and tells himself that it will be good for my hand. He talks to the bird, he talks to his hand and he hopes this breakfast would probably rejuvenate him. While waiting for the cramps to cease, he looks at the wasp environment nearby, the ducks falling by and says what I told you earlier, it is very difficult to be alone at sea. Slowly he understands that the slant of the bait line changes. 
What this means is that the fish has decided to come up to the surface. While he is watching the bait line slowly shift its slant, he also understands that the fish in its panic of being caught by the line is circling around the little skiff. And while he was watching, out of the blow comes a magnificent leap where the fish leaps and shows itself to San Diego. And San Diego, in all his years at the sea, had never seen a bigger fish in his life. The fish is bigger than anything he had ever seen in his life. In fact, the fish was two feet bigger than the skiff itself. It's nearing night by now. 86th night by now and San Diego is numb with pain. A dolphin takes the bait and San Diego pulls it in with the spare hand that he has and saves the meat for the next day. He tries to take rest for at least two hours he tries not to resist, but to let the line slowly go so that the fish would not panic. Rather come closer so he could club it or use his harpoon to kill it. And there we come to the 87th day. 87th day, the marlin wakes San Diego by jerking at the bait line. He jumps again and again and San Diego falls face down into the dolphin meat that is there on the ship, on the skiff. His hand is badly cut by now, bruised all over, bleeding. But he tells himself, pain does not matter to a man. I am not willing to let go. I will have my trophy. I am not willing to let go. Pain will not matter to a man. It is by now 87th morning and the sun is high up. The marlin circles closer and closer, inching closer and closer near the skiff. To a point where San Diego says, I don't, I, I don't know who will kill whom. Will you kill me, fish? Or will I kill you? You are this powerful, this gigantic that you could easily kill me. Are you going to kill me? Or will I be able to kill you? Closer and closer the marlin swims to the skiff. He can't be that big we find San Diego saying in between. Till you find the marlin tail out circling in out of the water, fish, while this fish closes in, Santiago says this beautiful line that I want you to listen. You're killing me, fish, the old man thought. But you have the right to. Never have I seen a greater a more beautiful or a calmer or more noble thing than you, brother. Come on and kill me. I do not care who kills who. This is a sort of a parting eulogy Santiago gives to this fish who had been with him through this struggle for life and for existence the last two days. A parting compliment that he gives to his dying brother. He says this and by now the fish slowly inches towards the skiff. San Diego makes sure that the death is swift and sudden. He takes the harpoon, aims it at the heart of the fish and kills it immediately without pain. 
at least that is what San Diego could do. Kill it as swiftly as he could. He lifted the harpoon, the text says, and drove it down with all his strength near the heart of the fish. The fish came alive with death in its body. He rose out of water showing his entire splendor, its entire power and beauty and fell over the sea in one splash that drenched the little skiff and the old man. And that was the death of this amazing Marlin. San Diego sits back, almost sorry, sad, and pulls the harpoon back. Then he tries to think of the money he would get by selling the fish. He looks at his hand, which to him resembles almost raw meat. Mast up, sail drawn, the man, the fish and the boat move back into the Havana, move back home and thus starts the return journey. But an hour later, the first shark arrives, a Mako shark. The shark slowly starts circling the fish. The old man sinks his harpoon into the shark's head and the shark sinks down. But not before taking almost 40 pounds from the marlin. The old man looks at the beautiful body of the marlin mutilated and looks at it with sorrow. But it's not just sorrow that is emotion then. He also knows the inevitable. The smell of the blood is going to attract more and more sharks. And the journey back home would take days. Would he be able to save his trophy? Would he be able to bring the fish back and materialize his dreams? We are yet to see. But by the time the first Mako shark the beautiful Mako shark had not been for its face, says the text. But by the time the first Mako shark is killed by the old man and he slips down into the sea, the destruction had already begun. Fresh blood spills into the sea and more and more sharks started coming in. The first to come were two shovel-nosed sharks. San Diego starts feeling upset. He understands the inevitable and he tries to encourage himself by thinking about DiMaggio and tries to tell himself that there are two things that is going to keep my sanity. One, I have to keep my thoughts clear and two, I have to think about baseball. That's all I have left now my thoughts and baseball and while he is thinking about the fish he tries reasoning it out to himself why did I do this he tries telling himself it is not a sin to kill a fish I killed it to keep myself alive and I killed it to feed people I killed it not only for food, but I also killed it for pride because I am a fisherman and my pride will be hurt if I let it go free. For my pride, I killed the fish. I was born as a fisherman. This is my duty, my karma. I am born as a fisherman. As the fish was born to be a fish, so there is no sin in what I did. 
he reasons this out with himself. He sailed further away towards home for another two hours and then from out of the blow he sees the first of the two sharks coming in. And the only noise that comes out of him is this word, I. A noise that a man might make when he is being crucified. These sharks that come floating in towards the prize, smelling the fresh blood of the marlin, are what he calls as the shovel-nosed sharks, predators. Two comes, he kills them. Another two comes, he kills them. And then a whole pack comes. He tries clubbing it all down. He loses his harpoon. He, ties, he tries using his gaff. He tries using the club. He tries using whatever is available to him in and around him. He tries using it all. But Packs of sharks come and take away whatever is left of the marlin till there is nothing left but mere bones. He tells the fish, I am sorry. He could feel the fish grow lighter as the fish is being ripped apart, body of the fish is being ripped apart by sharks from all sides. He could feel the fish grow lighter. And he reminded the fish of how many sharks you had killed when you were alive. Fish I have killed for you too. But I couldn't help it. I couldn't help these sharks picking you out. San Diego does what he could with his club, fights, tries to kill as many sharks as he could. But the sharks come in hordes and pick what is left of the marlin till there is only a skeleton that's left. San Diego is tired. San Diego spits blood thrice into the water. By the time the whole deed is done, it's 10 o'clock at night, 87th night, and he sees the glow of the Havana. He sees the city lights nearby. He tells himself, Am I punished for my pride for going out that far into the sea where no fisherman goes? Am I punished? Is that why I got the perfect gift I could only to be taken away? Was this a divine punishment for my pride? Stiff and sore, San Diego shoulders the mast almost as Christ taking his crucifix, walks down, slips down and somehow or the other reaches his shack. The skiff and the body, the skeleton, the fish bone of the gigantic marlin remains outside on the shore and on the 88th day, as always, Manolin runs to San Diego's shack to see if his mentor is there, to find a sleeping San Diego. Manolin has tears in his eyes when he sees the wounded hands. He runs to bring him coffee with lots of sugar and milk. And gently comes to talk to him. By then, people from the village had gathered around the fishbone. 
nobody had seen a fish like that they could all imagine what a catch it would have been but the bone of the marlin was fit only for garbage they did feel pity for the poor old man who had caught the largest fish ever caught by any other fisherman when the story closes we find san diego and manalin speaking with each other and manalin saying i am going to come with you next time when you go out for fishing no matter what anybody says i am going to come with you and san diego did prove his promises to manalin right by fighting for what he was best at it is not the trophy that matters it is not the prize that matters but how we fend ourselves in a struggle that matters when the story closes we find san diego lying back eyes closed his dreams taking him back to lions playing on long golden beaches a comfortable smile on his lips and we understand that this story of san diego the greatest fisherman who ever lived and this story of the marlin the greatest fish that ever lived an eternal story would remain in our hearts because remember it is the journey that matters not the destination it is the struggle that matters not the price and this story will stand true because no matter how many days it took the story of santiago is not the story of defeat it is the story of survival and that we need to remember